Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. We give glory and honor to our God for giving us this time to meditate and ponder upon His Word. We thank the Lord that we can worship Him corporately as a church today. And I hope and pray that more of us are watching this video as as I have observed in the previous Sundays, in the previous uh, videos, there are only a few who are watching our live recording. So I hope and pray that you're going to show your support to our ministry, to our church, by watching our live videos every Sunday. Again, this is just a small aspect, as a small um, sacrifice that is required of us to wake up early, perhaps, for 9.30. But this is something that would surely benefit us. Now, this morning, I'm going to talk about... Um, Somehow similar to what I have discussed last Sunday. Since last Sunday, if you could still remember, I was talking about the parable of the wise man and the foolish man, or the wise and the foolish builders. This morning, I'm going to talk about again with regards to another parable. This time, I'm talking about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Perhaps some of you are so familiar, perhaps some of you are quite familiar with this passage as this is one of those familiar, one of those famous parables of Jesus Christ. And this is a well-known parable to Christian circles and even non-Christian circles. If you're going to ask non-Christian circles, they can always relate to the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, this is this title is not given by Jesus Christ. This title is given by Bible scholars. Perhaps you're wondering if G did Jesus Christ give this title or did Jesus Christ name the title of this parable. It was not his uh, custom at the, time, at the time. He was not responsible in giving the title of this parable. It was, or it is, the responsibility of the Bible scholars or the, Bi or the English translators or the Bible translators. They're the ones who are giving the title. So what you see in your Bibles, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that is given, the title is given by some Bible scholars. And now this passage is based on Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. So if you have your Bibles with you, open it to that page. I'm not going to read the entire passage this morning as because as we are going to progress into this sermon, we are going to look into each of the verses in each of the points that we have right here. So open your Bible still to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Now in this parable, the title alone implies that the Samaritans are not well known as good people. It's quite interesting if you could see right here that Jesus Christ or the title is or that Jesus Christ used the term good in trying to describe the Samaritan or this Samaritan in the story. It's quite interesting because Samaritans were not known to be good people, right? The Samaritans were known as Pagans, idolaters, they were known as wicked people during that time. They were not labeled as good, but Jesus Christ in this parable labels a Samaritan as someone who is good. Again, this is quite catchy. This is something that we need to look into this morning. When you talk about the Samaritans, let me give you a brief background about the Samaritans. Now, who were the Samaritans? Samaritans were despised by the Jews because they were known as half-breeds. The Jews consider the Samaritans as half-breeds because they are half-Jewish and half-Gentile. When the northern kingdoms were taken captive by the Assyrians, they intermarried them to settle in a place called Samaria just north of Judea. As usually happens in such cases, they adopt, these Jews adopt the worship of their false pagan gods falling into idolatry. When the Jews returned to Jerusalem and tried to rebuild the temple, the Samaritans would pour pig's blood in the temple area, which was to make the temple unclean. And the building project of the temple had to be stopped so that the temple area could be cleaned up again. This was detestable to the Jews and polluted what they considered to be a holy place. Therefore, the Samaritans were hated even more during, even more rather than the Roman conquerors. Again, this is... One thing that we need to learn about the Samaritans. So there's uh, there's a feud. There's uh, there's a bad blood, bad blood among the Jews and the Samaritans. They would not even walk in Samaria, but would go far out of their way, even if it was a longer trip, to avoid entering Samaria because they believed that the Samaritans were unclean people. Now this is precisely why Jesus mentioned the Samaritan. 
in this parable because he would be the least likely to ever help a fellow Jew because a Samaritan or the Samaritans also had a hate that was equal to that held by the Jews against the Jewish people because of the way that they were treated by them. But basically, the Samaritans were considered as bad and not a good kind of people. That's why this parable is so interesting, it's so catchy because of how Jesus Christ described the Samaritan. Again, the Samaritans were not known to be good people. They were labeled as unclean, they were labeled as wicked, paganistic, and idolatrous kind of people. Now, in the passage, the context of the story is found in verse 25. And we're going to look into that verse in a while. But that is where we find the context when Jesus had a conversation with a lawyer. Okay, In the story, Jesus Christ was having a conversation with a lawyer. If you could still remember, we used to study parables in the past. And again, the most important thing that we need to look into parables is the setting or the setting of the parable, the setting of the story. The setting describes about what led Jesus Christ to tell a parable. So in this story, if we may ask the question, what led Christ to tell a parable? What led him was was this, or rather was his conversation with this lawyer. So he had a conversation with this lawyer and they had an exchange of words that led Jesus Christ to tell and to share a parable. Now let me share with you only two truths this morning. Again, two truths. Uh, with different subpoints, these subpoints and this may uh, this the main outline are just easy or it's just easy to memorize so that right after this message, again you would continually you would continue to meditate upon the truths right here. Let me share with you two points this morning, and let me start with the first one, which is the questions that demand answers. Questions that demand answers. Now we find this in verses twenty five to twenty nine. Again. The context is found in verse 25 where it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, verse 25 mentions of a lawyer. In our time today, if we are going to apply this one, this description of a lawyer, we all know that what, what a lawyer is. A lawyer is someone who is well-versed about the Constitution, someone who is well-versed about the laws, and all other things that pertain to the government and the constitution of the government. That is how that is our understanding of the word lawyer. But this is quite different from the lawyer during the time of Jesus Christ. This lawyer in the passage is not the lawyer, it's not the kind of lawyer that we have today, right? Instead, he is someone who is a lawyer during the time of Jesus Christ, is someone who is knowledgeable with the laws of God or in the Bible rather than the laws of the government. So instead of being familiar and being well-versed with the laws of the government, this kind of lawyer is familiar instead with the laws of God, with the laws of the scripture, with the law of the Bible, or with perhaps with the Bible itself rather than the laws of the land. Specifically, this kind of lawyer is familiar and most acquainted with the laws of Moses in the Old Testament. In other words, this lawyer is not the lawyer that we understand in our time today. This lawyer is called as a scribe during the time of Jesus Christ, who is, of course, an expert of the law of Moses, an expert of the Mosaic law. So this is what this lawyer is all about. Now, we find in this verse, in verse 25, the scribe put, stood up to put Jesus to the test. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Now, if we look at the word test, the word test right here in Greek means to test thoroughly. Thoroughly. This is the same word that is used in Luke chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said. This is what we find in this passage. Also, uh, he said, so that they might hand in over to the power and authority of the governor. I think this is a different passage. Sorry, it's not Luke 20, 20. It's Luke chapter 4, verse 12. Okay? Where it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is also the same passage that we find in, rather in, um, 
in James chapter 1 verse 15 with regards to temptation. Meaning to say, this scribe was putting Jesus to the test in order to trap him and find flaws in his teachings. This is what the Pharisees and religious leaders would always do. They will trap Jesus Christ to say something that is contradicting to the law of Moses so that they can accuse him. And several times, Jesus Christ encountered this kind of strategy, this kind of tactic. But again, they would always um, fall against the wisdom. They would always fall against uh, the, the wisdom and the strategy of Jesus Christ. Remember, again, in verse 20, or chapter, Luke, this is the, 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 the verse right here. Luke chapter 20, verse 20, it says, Keeping, keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. They were hoping that they might catch Jesus Christ when he would say something wrong with regards to the law of Moses or something that is contradicting to the law of Moses so that they can hand him over to the authority and accuse him of these faults or these crimes right here. Other than this, also we find important details in the story that would prove to the motive of the scribe. One of it is that, G, or is that he addressed Jesus as a teacher. Okay? Instead of addressing Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So the scribe right here, the lawyer right here, he addressed Jesus Christ as a teacher. As teacher, instead of addressing Jesus Christ as a Messiah. So from that we find a different kind of motive. And other than that, verse 29 says, But he, desiring to justify himself, the scribe or this lawyer wanted to justify himself from what Jesus had told him. There's no doubt that this man's intention was to trap Jesus Christ. He was not there to learn more about the truth. He was not there to learn about salvation. He was not there to learn about eternal life. He was there to trap Jesus Christ. He was there to trick Jesus Christ so that they might be able to hand over Jesus Christ to the authorities. Okay? So, again, questions that the man answers. The first question, the first sub point is that the first question was answered by a question. What was the first question? What was the first question of the scribe? He said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? If you have noticed, he uses the term inherit, not obtain, not acquire. Now, what's the significance if he used the term inherit? The point is this. The word inherit implies something that will be given to you because it is your right. Like, for example, inheritance, okay? Something that is given to you because that is your right. Right, ako, I can have my inheritance from my father. Pero wala, ragot. Wala ko may inherit. <laughs> but that is my right. No, my inheritance. That is something that is given to me as part of my right. Okay? The question itself, if you're going to understand, contradicts the core teachings of Jesus because an inheritance of any form is the result of a relationship. Just like what I said a while ago, and that way, inheritance coming from my father because I have a relationship with my father. You will have an inheritance from your father because there is a relationship between the two of you. An inheritance is not a goal achieved through effort, right? You don't need to work for it because that is something that will surely be given to you. You don't need to work for it. Likewise, Eternal life is a gift we inherit from God through our relationship with Him, not something we earn through righteousness. So in other words, there, there's a big contradiction to the question of the scribe with regards to the core teaching of Jesus Christ. Because within the mind of the scribe, he was thinking that you can earn, you can have eternal life by working for it because of the, the use of the word inherit. In other words, this scribe believes that salvation can be obtained by good works. As what most religious leaders during the time of Jesus Christ believe in. That salvation, that eternal life is something that you work for, is something that you acquire through works of righteousness and keeping the laws, keeping the commandments in the Bible. Moreover, the Jews believe that salvation is something that they will inherit because they are the descendants of Abraham. Within the minds of the Jews, they believe that, ah, 
I have the, I have I can have salvation because this is something that I inherit as part of being the descendant of Abraham. Because they belong to the circumcision, they believe that as Jews, salvation will be inherited by them as a merit of being Abraham's descendants. But just like how Jesus answered those who would try to trap him, instead of giving a direct answer, he presents him a different question. So instead of answering this question right away, Jesus Christ answered this question through another question. And verse 26 says, this is how Jesus Christ responded to the question of the lawyer. Take a look at what he said. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? You know what, my brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus was so smart. He was so smart in doing this. Because, do you know why? It's because by asking this counter question, Jesus puts himself in the position of evaluating the lawyer's answer rather than having the lawyer evaluate his answer. Marunong kay si Jesus Christ, mga insuon, tungon kay pagpangutanan niya ang question, siya na mo'y naay katungod, siya na mo'y naa sa position nga mo evaluate sa tubag ni nga lawyer instead of that lawyer evaluating his answer to his question. This is a very smart move. Besides, Jesus did not want to give him an answer that would contradict to his beliefs, but just but Jesus asked him something that would help him interpret the correct meaning of the law. So this was a counterplay by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you know what? Other than this, perhaps we may ask the question, why did Jesus Christ lead the man back to the law in order to answer his question? I mean, Jesus could have directly said, oh, you need to repent, you need to turn away from your sins, and you need to place your faith and your trust in God so that you would be saved. Jesus Christ could have been could have given that answer right away because that is indeed the answer to this question. What was Jesus trying to suggest right here of leading the man back to the law of Moses, back to the law of the scriptures? The point is this. Jesus points the lawyer or the scribe back to what is written in the law because if the question is what shall I do to inherit eternal life, the answer is simple. And that is, you need to keep the law of God, but keep it perfectly, right? Keep it perfectly. The point is that if one is able to keep the entire law of God without falling out into a single commandment, he will be saved. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 5, So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them, I am the Lord. The problem is this. Nobody or no one is able to keep all of the commandments. That's why when you try to achieve and when you try to earn salvation by keeping all of the commandments, you will always fail because nobody is able to keep all of the commandments. Nobody is able to obey all of the laws of God because we are not perfect since we are all sinners. That is why it is impossible for a person to be saved if he relies on keeping the entire law of God by obeying all of them. Salvation is not by good works, my brothers and sisters in Christ. James chapter 2, it's not here. James chapter 2 verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. This verse tells us of the impossibility of keeping the entire law of God. That's why you can never rely upon it for your own salvation. This is what Jesus Christ meant in their conversation. So to make it simpler, Jesus Christ was as if telling the scribe, salvation is not by good works. But he was so smart in giving the counter question. The scribe needed to know this because he was relying upon keeping the law his whole life for him to be saved. He needed to hear this truth from Jesus Christ. Now in verse 27, the scribe replied, and this is how the scribe replied, and he answered, what, 
the, he, this is the answer to the question of Jesus Christ. The, the scribe said, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. The scribe presented the greatest commandment of all time. This is the greatest commandment. We have also the greatest commission, but this is the greatest commandment. In answering, he gave this answer to the question of Jesus Christ. And for him, it's all about loving the Lord your God with your entire life and loving your neighbor as you have loved yourself. Look at the response of Jesus Christ. This is also how Jesus Christ replied. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. <coughs> Do this and you will live. The scribe was indeed right in saying this, but Jesus puts an emphasis on applying this especially on the part where he needs to love his neighbor. You know what? In other words, Jesus is saying that the scribe needed to put into practice what the law required. The problem with the Pharisees and the scribes is that they were well-versed in memorizing scriptures. They were so well-versed in the laws of the Old Testament, but they have failed to put those things into practice. They have not put into action the things that they were knowledgeable about with regards to the Word of God. This would tell us that Jesus was directly challenging the scribe to apply what he knows about the law of Moses. Jesus Christ just agreed to the answer of the scribe, but he puts an emphasis that you need to apply that. You need to apply what you've learned through the Word of God, through the law of Moses. Now, in application, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the point is this. There's always the need to put into practice the things that you have learned from the Word of God. Remember last Sunday? If you were watching last Sunday, again, the message was all about putting into action the things that you have learned from the Word of God, right? And Jesus used the parable of the foolish man and the wise man with regards to that point. This is also what we learn from this parable like right here. We need to put into action, we need to apply the things that we have learned from the Word of God. You know what? Application is the most accurate indication that one has understood the lesson. You can claim to have understood the message or the sermon or the lesson if you have not applied it in your life. Now, this is the problem that Jesus Christ was trying to point out with regards to the lives of the scribes and the Pharisees. They know a lot from the Word of God but they have not applied any single lesson that they have learned from the Word of God. Perhaps you're that kind of Christian. You're so knowledgeable about the Scriptures, but how about with regards to the aspect of application? Have you applied what you've learned from the Word of God? What's worse than this is that if we don't apply what we have learned from God's Word, then we are hypocrites. If we are not applying what we've learned from the Word of God, that would make us become hypocrites. We are like Pharisees, right? We are like the Pharisees. They claim to know a lot of things, but they claim to know a lot of things about the Word of God, but they have not applied all the things that they have learned. That's why they were hypocrites. The point, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is that let's not be hypocrites by not applying what we have learned from the Word of God. Let's do what we are supposed to do. The second sub-point is, the second question was answered by a narration. Again, the first question, and you also find right here, the second question, which was answered by Jesus Christ through a narration. Obviously, the scribe would not accept what Jesus Christ said, so that's why Jesus Christ says in verse 29, this is what Jesus Christ said in verse 29, um, no, this is the answer of the scribe. Because he couldn't accept what Jesus Christ was telling him. Verse 29, But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Kinsa akong silingan? If ako maganiling apply, kinsa man akong silingan? Who is my neighbor that I need to love as well? The word neighbor comes from the Greek word plision, means, which means one who is near. And that is based upon Acts chapter 7, verse 27. The Hebrew word that it translates is Rhea means a person with whom one has something to do. And you know what? This is the mentality of the Jews. 
the Jews interpreted the word in a limited sense to mean a fellow Jew or someone in the same religious community. They specifically excluded Samaritans and foreigners from this category. That's why the, the, the scribes or the scribe was asking, who is my neighbor? Because in their mentality, in the mentality of the Jews, in the mentality of the scribes and the Pharisees, the neighbor or a neighbor is only limited to fellow Jews and not outside of the Jewish community. Gentiles and Samaritans were not included. That's why this led Jesus Christ to tell a parable or to tell the parable of the good Samaritan because within the minds of the Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees, his neighbor or their neighbor is <coughs> only limited to the Jewish community, only limited to their fellow Jewish or fellow Jews. This is why Jesus Christ, this is the setting and this is what led Jesus Christ to tell a parable. We're done with the first point. Let's proceed to the second point which is an answer that demands attention. An answer that demands attention. And this is now the parable proper. We're going to look into the proper or the parable proper. Now in answer to the question of the scribe, Jesus defines a neighbor with an illustration this is how Jesus Christ defines the word neighbor or the term neighbor in response to the question of the scribe, who is my neighbor? Now, both Jesus Christ and the Pharisee and the scribe had different understanding of the word neighbor. To the scribe, again, the neighbor is only limited to fellow Jews, but to Jesus Christ, he had a different definition and a different understanding of the word neighbor. And he explains it through this parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, there are two things. Under this truth, there are two things that we need to know about the parable. And these two things are basically the theme of this parable right here. These two themes. Two things. The first is the callousness of the religious officials. This is one of the highlights of the parable of Jesus Christ. The callousness of the religious officials. Now, we read in verse 30... Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Let me give you a brief background of this parable right here. During the time of Jesus Christ, the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, according to the story, the road from Jericho to Jerusalem was 18 miles long. Maybe it was not a road at all, but a narrow strip of path sandwiched in between rocky mountains. So, gamay kay siya na path niya na mga rocky mountains in between. Even today, most parts of the highway connecting Jerusalem with Jericho runs in between mountains. The road from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho <coughs> was infamous. It was infamous. It was known for crimes and robberies. This road that Jesus Christ was talking about right here, it wasn't surprising, it wasn't surprising to Jesus' listeners that he said the story on this particular road. Clothing, if you've noticed, Yubuan who stripped him. Because during the time, clothing was a valuable commodity in Jesus' society. Siguro Chanel or Gucci when he was shrugged. Because clothing was a valuable commodity in Jesus' society. And this fact probably explains why the bandits took his clothes or took the man's clothes in the story. In verse 31, as we progress, this is what we read. Jesus says, Now by chance, so moto ang story, na ay usa ka tao nga gi robbed, nga gi stripped off, and he was robbed. And then, na ay mga tao nga ning labay. No, this is what verse 31 is saying us. <clears throat> now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Who? Oh. <laughs> Take a look at the callousness of this priest. Take a look at the callousness of this religious leader. He saw the person who was robbed and who was left half naked, and when after seeing him, he banishes pikas agi anan. Now, the question is, again, when we interpret parables, na representations, no? who does the priest represent right here? 
Who does this priest represent right here? Obviously, he represents the Pharisees, the scribes, and all the religious acting people. I'm saying all the religious acting people. It's all because there are a lot of re acting religious people who look good on the outside, but in the inside, they are not good, right? Just like this priest right here, just like the Pharisees during the time of Jesus Christ. What did the priest do? When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side and did nothing. This priest went out of his way to avoid the man because as a priest, and we can assume it was a Jewish priest, he didn't want to make himself unclean by associating with someone who may have had blood on them. That was the law of the Jews. That's what, that was the law of the Jews. They would not want to be unclean by helping a person who has blood on them. But this is just an assumption, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus did not complicate the motive behind why the priest did not help the man. But the point is this. The priest failed to act in love even though common courtesy demanded that he stop and render aid. He failed to act in love. However, a priest of all people, right, of all people, should have shown compassion. No? Pari yung tani, religious leader yung tani. Siya yung tani, most qualified yung mupakita o compassion ani tawana. But he was so indifferent to the situation of this man. He served in a helping occupation and he had frequent contact with the scriptures and their demands. Moreover, this priest had recently been in Jerusalem, the center of worship and spiritual influence. This is the problem that we find right here. Verse 32, so the first man who had witnessed this helpless man who was robbed is a priest. The second is in verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Parihagyapun. The Levite did the same thing of not extending help and passed by on the other side. He was a less likely person to offer help since his duty, assuming he fulfilled it, involved just assisting the priests in the mundane affairs involved in worship. By omitting his motives, Jesus again focused attention on the man's unloving act. And both the priest and the Levite were guilty of the sin of omission. The sin of omission, again, we all know that. No? Well, you, you're supposed to do this and you have not done it. Then you have committed the sin of omission. But one thing that I've noticed from the story is that Jesus Christ did not tell of the racial origins of the victim. He tells about the priest, he tells about, he talks about the Levite, but he did not mention the origin. Jesus Christ did not say that whether he is a Jew or a Gentile. Do you know why? It is because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because help is not mindful of race, it's not mindful of gender, it's not mindful of age, it's not mindful of social status, it's not mindful of religious background, nor of physical appearance, nor whatever barrier you can think of. Help is not limited in all of these aspects. Instead, help is not even overshadowed by fear, but it is driven by love and concern towards the needy. This is what help should look like. Now the question is, how many times have we been guilty of the sin of omission? How many times have we been indifferent to the needs of others? The story tells us the indifference of other people with regards to the needs of others. Now if we apply this truth in our situation right now, <coughs> In this time of pandemic, how are we in terms of being sensitive to the needs of others? How are we, my brothers and sisters in Christ? I'm glad that our church has been so sensitive to the needs of our outreach ministries in Lamak and also in Maracas. But sometimes, you know what? We tend to be selective also when it comes to helping others. Can you relate to this one? We tend to be selective 
when it comes to helping others. When we find a person not worthy to be helped, we disregard help him and help those who are more worthy of our help. This is not the kind of attitude that Jesus wants us to have in this time of pandemic. And the truth is this, my brothers and sisters in Christ. You can claim to be a follower of Christ, yet disregard the needy. God loves the poor and is offended when his children neglect them. It's so hard to claim to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are being insensitive to the needs of your fellow brothers and even to the needs of your fellow human beings. The same thought applies to this parable. You can claim to be a disciple of Christ, yet withhold help towards others. You can claim to be a Christian, yet remain indifferent towards the needs of others. We can claim to be the church of Jesus Christ, yet disregard the needs of our own community. Right? That's why we made effort in reaching out to Maracas, because we can claim to be the church of Jesus Christ if we are so indifferent to the needs even in our own community. My friends, this is something that we need to ponder upon. Lahub needs salvation and the people in Maracas need the basic necessities in life. We can be callous towards their needs and if we are truly concerned for them, then we need to put it into action. Not just our outreach ministries, but even some of our members, some of the members of our church. Now remember, we are still in this pandemic and we don't know what are the needs of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ here in our church. This is the best time for us to be proactive in helping our fellow believers in Jesus Christ. We find about the callousness of the religious leaders. The second aspect is we f- that we find is the compassion of the Samaritan. Now take a look at verse 33. Again, the priest and the Levite, both of them were indifferent to the need of the man who was robbed. But take a look at what the Samaritan did according to the story. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. This verse tells us that the Samaritan had compassion. The meaning of the word compassion in Greek is to be moved in the inward parts. <coughs> what are the inward parts? Okay, if we may ask, to be moved in the inward parts. That's what it means by the word compassion. What are the inward parts? The inward parts, according to Bible scholars, refer to the heart, lungs, liver, and kidneys. That's the literal interpretation of the inward parts. But what do these parts represent? The heart, the lungs, the liver, and the kidneys. What do these parts represent? They represent the seat of affection. In other words, the Samaritan was so affectionate to the victim. He was so affectionate to the victim. You know what? We use the word affectionate, okay? If that is how we describe it. We use the word affectionate when we are infatuated to a person or when we like a person or even when we love a person. So, mga youth, drama, crush, crush, kana. You are being, uh, you're af- af- being affectionate to that person. Sa mga crush. Usually, we don't have affections towards Strangers, but they no, no. Dili ka affectionate sa strangers. There's no such thing as that. Tungod ka, you are only affectionate to your crush, sa imuhang asawa, sa imuhang kinsanan dira. But usually, you're not affectionate to strangers, but only to those whom you already know. But you know what? In the story, the Samaritan had so much affection, right? This is so unique. The Samaritan was so affectionate to this person, so much concerned to a total stranger. He was a total stranger. This man that the Samaritan helped is a total stranger. Now what does this tell us? What truth can we learn out of this? Love knows no limits. Love knows no limits. Sometimes, we put a limit to our love by giving it to those whom we think as deserving 
Usahay atong limitahan atong gugma mga Isoon. And we only give our love to those people whom we think are deserving of our love. Sometimes, we only show love and concern for those people that we know and most importantly, people that we like. <coughs> but Jesus reminds us right here that love knows no boundaries. Love knows no boundaries. It knows no limits that even a total stranger deserves to be an object of it. Now this kind of situation that we are in, in this pandemic that we are in, this is the best situation to apply this kind of love. To apply this kind of love that Jesus Christ is talking about right here. Now we have written down this caption sa tuang walls, there is a stage Passion for the Lord and compassion for the lost. Passion for the Lord. Siguro, taon na mo wakabisita dali sa simbahan. Naragapon. <laughs> Ay, huwag ka balat ka. Naragapon siya. Kanin, passion for the Lord and compassion for the lost. How do we explain this one? Passion speaks of love while compassion speaks of putting love into action. If we truly love the Lord, my friends, if we truly love the Lord, then we put it into action by helping those who are in need and showing love for those who encounter in our everyday activities. How are we in terms of our love for God and our compassion for the lost? Are we putting God's love into action by helping those who are in need? Again, in this time of pandemic, there are so many people who are in need. I gave you a challenge a few months ago that you need to pamumusta your fellow member, fellow leader, or fellow believer in Christ in our church. Musta naman sa inyong mga needs. How are we in terms of that challenge with regards to that challenge that I gave you a few months ago? Now, going back to the story, it says in verse 34, He went to him, this is what the Samaritan did, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Oil soothed the victim's wounds and wine disinfected them. Just like what is mentioned in the story. The Samaritan's love was obvious in his willingness to inconvenience himself and to make generous and costly sacrifices for the other man's good. The genuineness of his love is clear from his provision of further care the next day and took care of him. Take a look at the next day. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you need, I will repay you when I come back. Imagine the generosity of this Samaritan. Again, ato paging pasumbraan ang ato ang generosity towards others. Just like what, we mean, what we've learned from this story. Now as I close this message this morning, in our lives, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we can also become like the priest. We can become like the priest and the Levite who were so indifferent to the victim. Pwede kita na mahimo tang sama sa priest o sa Levite na kalos kayo, indifferent kayo to the victim. The main cause for this is our insensitivity towards others, our indifference towards others, the root cause of this problem is our own selfishness. Our own selfishness. We tend to think too much of our own lives and have failed to consider the lives of others. My friends, this pandemic can either cause us to be self-centered or to be selfless. We can be self-centered if we're only thinking of our own needs and our own welfare. But we can be selfless by attending to the needs of others more than just thinking of our own personal needs. My friends, you're all financially affected by this crisis. Our church, to be honest, is also affected financially due to this pandemic. But as I close, let me tell you this. The heart of a true disciple of Christ is most tested when he has less in his life 
yet there is more that is needed from him. The true heart or the heart of a true disciple of Christ is most tested. Your heart and my heart is most tested when we have less due to this pandemic, due to this crisis, when we have less in our lives, yet there is so much needed from us. My friends, are you this kind of disciple? Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, salamat from, for what you have spoken to us this morning. We give you praise and we give you thanks for the message. Thank you for using this parable, Lord, to remind us of our love for others, as a product of our love for you, O God. Lord, in this time of pandemic, many are in need, and many are suffering from financial crisis. But Lord God, usahay kami wala po. But Lord God, this is the best time for us to put everything that we have learned from your word into practice. Lord God, we are most tested when we have less, and yet there is more needed from us. As your disciples, O God, help us to be like the good Samaritan who was so affectionate even to strangers, Lord God, who was so pa passionate by helping the man who was in need. Help us, O God, to apply this in our lives. We thank you, O God, for speaking to us. I pray that this word of yours, this message of yours would touch the hearts of your people. Salamat, Lord God, for this time. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. That's all for this morning. Thank you for watching. See you again tomorrow for our daily devotions. Bye-bye and God bless.